groups and different organizations coming and trying to take transit for a few days to kind of see how it is by its viability and to see what citizens see in that is kind of what this conversation is about. So we have obviously Councillor Sean Frazier, um, Brad Benanji, or sorry, Sure, it sounded good. <laughs> sorry, it sounded good. Right? Yeah. Uh, he's from First Nations University. We've got uh, <laughs> a little bay. Brooke Patterson. Brooke Patterson from University of Virginia. And, um, That's okay, we have Tyler from Carmichael Yeah, we've got a few other people, but kind of a bad joke, but they might be like the bus or something. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got everyone here uh, just to kind of get, you know, a discussion going about what transit means for Regina and partly to see what kind of experience they had from people that might not often ride the bus and to see what gets people to ride the bus because that's kind of an issue sometimes. This just was last year, we got a 9% increase in ridership, which is great, and we want to see more of that. So how can we get that going? And part of this discussion is to try to get an idea, because there'll be some new stuff coming to City Council in regards to transit and kind of some ideas that they have that they want to work. And this is kind of a way for Sean and other councillors like Barbara from Ward 1 who's here, to kind of get an idea of what that can mean and what citizens want to see out of the transit. We've got a few officials, a group from the Department of Transit and a few people who created the uh, Drive Live, was that? The Transit Live. Transit Live, I'm sorry. And trying to see what kind of feedback we get in the discussion that we get going. So I guess we'll go down with everyone, they'll kind of talk about their experience, good and bad, and kind of get going from there. Okay, great. Well, thank you all so much uh, for coming out. This is a, a great turnout. I was hoping it wasn't just going to be me and Mr. Lee, so I'm very glad to see all your faces. Uh, yeah, a quick uh, mention, I'd really like to say thank you to Councillor Young, Barbara Young, from Ward 1. Uh, Barbara has a very, very, very busy schedule between family and work and council obligations. And a whole bunch of credentials. Sure, sorry. Thank you. This is, I need a megaphone, right? This is the same thing I do every time. Just like to say thanks to Councillor Young for coming out today. Also, we have Nathan Looney and Tracy from, from Transit. And uh, Craig and Second, who are the two of the brains behind the Transit Live app, uh, the smartphone application for uh, using GPS real time for, for the transit system. So I'll say my the first idea I had to, to try this 10 day for transit, 10 days of transit event. Um, actually, last spring I did something called uh, Shop Local. For a month, my family and I uh, shopped in the ward for a month and sort of used it as a chance to use social media to engage people about a, a civic, you know, a, a city issue, I guess. Um, my goal this year was to try to do two events like this, and, and this was, uh, you know, just seemed like another thing. You know, transit, as John mentioned, transit has increased 9% this year with no increase to the budget. So as the city grows, as the economy heats up and all these things, transit is one of the changes we're seeing, and I thought that would be a good fit. Um, initially, I hoped to do it in September. Um, there was free, uh, free Fridays in September. Nathan and I talked about that would be a, a good time to encourage other people to use the bus too. With the uh, referendum and some other issues coming up, we pushed it back a month, but... Um, yeah, just to speak of my, my experience, um, it's been really great actually so far. Lots of feedback, lots of people engaging on social media, uh, lots of people emailing me and phoning me, uh, especially people stopping on the bus, I love that. Someone will come up and say, hey, you Sean? Yeah, I'm Sean. Well, here's what I think of this. Um, yeah, lots of feedback. I guess this is sort of my impression. I, I don't actually ride the bus much. Uh, my wife and I bought a house purposely close to downtown, so it was close to her work and to my work. I love cycling as much as I can, I love walking. Taking the bus in Regina is a bit of a novelty to me. If I travel to other cities, I always uh, try to make a point or it ends up that I take transit in other cities. I'm always impressed with how, um, how good and easy it is usually in other big Canadian cities. And Regina, I just, it's, never, it's never really come up. You know, I've been on the bus before, but I haven't really used it much. So the past 10 days, um, I'll say that in some way it was surprisingly easy. Uh, you, I had to change my schedule, you know. I'm, I'm bad at showing up late for things. Anyone who knows me knows that I'm, I'm always either just on time or just a few minutes late. And you can't do that with transit. If you're scheduling, if you're going to be on the bus and you're scheduling, um, you have to go when the bus goes. So I actually found it, in some way, it was sort of relaxing to actually, for some meetings, show up 20 minutes early for the first time in my life. <laughs> um, so that was a positive. I would say that I had a bit of a frustration with not knowing when buses were going to be there exactly. I missed one bus because I think it showed up early, or I showed up a couple minutes early and the bus wasn't there. To me, that that was very frustrating, and I had to walk. <laughs> um, a few late buses too. Uh, some of that is just the reality of um, you know of, of the transit system we have, and I think some of that is what we need to work on improving is to make sure that buses are are consistent. 
Um, I would say for sure that the number one positive point of my experience was about uh, the people, actually. I think everyone I've had contact with in, in the de transit department, um, I'm not coming out of this thinking, oh, I found like these wicked ideas that that's what needs to change. I think actually Transit has a really good handle on how to run a great bus system and trends in other Canadian cities and how we make sure Transit is the best it can be. Uh, so the department has been really good. Bus drivers, bus drivers have been universally friendly. And I would say that um, the, great part, the greatest part of it being the bus actually is the other people riding the bus. It's Regina sort of at its finest. It, that was my experience anyways, that it's people, uh, strangers talking to strangers, people sharing seats, people uh, helping someone off with their stroller, on with their stroller, these sorts of things. So all in all, I think this was um, a positive experience for me personally. As far as what I hope to take out of this, uh, as some of you know, Transit has a, um, is bringing a report back to City Council next month about the idea of maybe keeping larger buses outside of downtown. I, I'll be honest, my initial gut reaction when I heard that, my, my first thought was, that sounds like a bad idea to me. It sounds like an extra transfer for people. I know lots of other big cities do that, so I'm, I'm trying to keep an open mind about that. Um, I think having ride, ridden the bus a bit, I, you know, I'm optimistic to hear maybe there's a good way for us to do that. My experience is though that it, it likely would mean just an extra transit for people, a transfer for people riding the bus. Um, another thing that I think is like one of these opportunities um, is about expanding service to the airport and also potentially expanding it to uh, the global transportation hub. Now we'll get into more details about the holdups for these, and it's always money, unfortunately. But um, you know, it's not something that can necessarily happen overnight. But to me, that would make sense. Also, as someone who um, lived on campus for a couple of years. I had my education from the U of R and I, I lived on campus and off campus. When I never owned a car, I always cycled or walked. And uh, as someone who lived on campus for a couple of years and actually didn't know about Regina while I lived on campus, I never, I came like the odd time to live music, but I didn't know about downtown Regina as a student on campus. So that's another possibility that really excites me. Um, whether that might mean someday in our lifetime a U pass or if not that just better service to the university. I think that's on my mind that having a good connection with the university is actually not just about students, it's also about downtown culture and how we get not people just to campus, but people off of campus. Uh, to me, that's a really important thing. Regina is a great city. One of the challenges is though, that usually a university town means young people. If you go to downtown Montreal, or let's not compare ourselves to the other places that are bigger places or whatever, but oftentimes when there's a university culture in a town, it means more young people, more youthful energy, more live music, more bars open at night, all these fun things that make a city great. In Regina, unfortunately, because the campus is so far away, being a university town here actually means less young people downtown. It means that, well, there's some young people here, but where are the rest of us, you know? Like, this is a challenge. So I think that uh, this is the attitude that I've sort of come away with, is that transit has to be a service. It has to be looked at as a service for people who need it, but also we have to have the attitude that transit isn't just for the people that need it, it's for the city, it's for the well-being of the city. It's for people that don't like traffic congestion, and it's also for how, to, how we build a culture of people actually getting out and uh, being able to enjoy themselves. So I think we talked long enough, and I think we'll have some more questions after this, so I'm just going to keep quiet. But um, yeah, that's it. Thanks. <laughs> Because after these last 10 days of running the transit, I like to sit. Sit and wait. You know, sit on the bus and wait more. Um, no, it was really great. It was a, it was a unique experience for me. I, I've taken the bus a few times. Um, I live on so far east that when I look out my door, I just see prairie. So it was a unique experience in the sense that I, can, I have a class at 9.30 in the morning. I wake up. At 8.45, I'm out the door at 10 after 9 in my car and I'm at school in class. This was a whole different experience for me. It was like get up an hour early, figure out which bus I wanted to take, how I'm going to get there, how long is it going to take me to stop and get my coffee and then get to class, or do I go to class and then get my coffee after? Or the other. So the first, the first day was, it was unique. We, Brooke and I actually rode, we rode the bus from the university after a, after a board meeting. Rode it downtown on a Monday night. Everything was dead, shut down. It was like dark, it was like desolate. It felt like we were deserted in this, you know when you're playing a video game where you see somebody playing a video game, you're just that one person waiting there? That was us. 
just sitting there. One guy rode by on a bike and he yelled, I'll be back in 15 minutes. Like, I don't even know who he's talking to. <laughs> and so and then it took a little bit of time to get home. So that was the first day. The second day, I took a different bus. I took a different bus and I see some opportunities of shortcuts. You don't know where you're going to get off. You don't know where the stops are because on the Giants of Live, I'm, I'm watching, I'm waiting at the bus stop and I can see the bus coming like, oh, it's going to be turning. Yep, there it is. And it shows up, but you don't know where you're going to stop. That was another thing that was challenging for me. So you pull the, pull the draw cord, pull the string, and then ding, where am I getting off? You don't know. Then you get off and you find out. But yesterday was, uh, oh, I actually, there, there's an express that goes from Victoria Express to bus number 50 is what I would take to come downtown and I transfer to university and then I can go to university. And I took the bus back home and he's like, okay, this is the last stop. I'm like, what? And I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, actually we stopped at the Superstore. I'm like, so I have to walk now? So that was a good learning experience. Last night I was thinking, I drove by this park in Park Ridge. I'm like, oh, there's my place right there. I'm gonna, I'm getting off this next stop. I'm gonna do it. I got off. Started walking, like, there's my place right there. This is so close. And then as I got closer to the field, closer, there's this huge drop off and there's a huge creek. I had to like, I ended up walking <laughs> further than anything. I had, a, I had a good laugh about that one. Um, just to touch on what Sean was saying, the most unique experience, the most pleasurable experience of it was actually, was the people. The people are always, when people ride on the bus, obviously they're familiar with it, so it was easy to spark up a conversation with somebody that was sitting across, oh, do you know if this bus stops at this time? But the bus drivers, actually, they, they were really helpful. Like, it was, it was really cool. I even, even actually, the bus driver, we found out that his mom is related to my grandpa, so that also made us cousins. I'm like, what? <laughs> So I can say, I can honestly say I've met a family member that I never had a clue about on the bus, and he was driving. So I have a bus guy now. That's a good one. Yeah, so it was definitely the bus driver. And what I, what I noticed was it takes a couple days to get the hang of where you want to go. But as long as you're determined, when I did, I was on Global this morning, and what I, what I indicated was it's, it took me a while to learn the ropes. But it's just like when you're 15 and you get your learners and you have to start driving, you have to learn the ropes, where to parallel park, what the signs mean. That's a lot more difficult than learning how to ride the bus, especially in a city like this. In December, I was in Santiago, Chile, and that was a nightmare. It's like, and plus I didn't speak Spanish, so <laughs> top it off. It made it, it made it more of a nightmare, but it was a great experience. So coming, coming through this experience, thanks to Sean allowing me to take part in this, I realized that I've been downtown a lot more than I ever have in the year, you know, so it was, uh, it enabled me to be able to realize there are other options out there for public transit and that it's not a nightmare that you would think of if you just think about it. The only thing was getting up an hour earlier, I'm looking forward to sleeping in tomorrow. <laughs> Brooke? Okay. Brooke Patterson. Um, I'm also going to sit because I feel more comfortable here as well. Um, so I actually just want to start on probably what was my best situation or best moment and also my worst moment taking the transit and it was the first day when I was taking it with Brad but I just need to explain some of the details about what made it really bad and what really made it good. So we were taking a bus. Usually I found out I have a wonderful route from my place. I live really far east similar to Brad. I don't see the prairies, all I see is Brad's condo. So I'm also very far east. Um, so I thought my room was going to be horrible. I was like, it's definitely going to be an hour. And I actually found out it was a pretty good route. It's about 25 minutes when it's not dead, or when it is dead, and then about 35 during rush hour. Usually it takes me 15 minutes plus however long it takes me to find parking, and then finally walking from the mile away I am parking at the university. So I was really happy with that, and pleasantly surprised. And then I come to find out this route only goes till 5.30. So this is a problem when me and Brad have a board meeting at 5.30. So we decide to take a trip downtown because we're going to have to take a transfer. And the bus is running a little bit late. Um, so the bus driver realizes this because, of course, we were asking questions about transferring. And he's super helpful. And he actually radioed another bus driver and asked them to wait for us because he knew we were going to miss it. And 
the other bus didn't wait, but I really appreciate it. <laughs> the good was that I really appreciated that the bus driver did that. Um, now to the bad part. Me, and, if I didn't have Brad, like a big guy, waiting with me for half an hour outside in deserted downtown, I would have felt very safe and uncomfortable. And there was, the mall was closed because it was Monday night. If there was no shelter around, like, there was nothing for us to do. And it's only mid-October. I couldn't have imagined how awful this would have been in the winter time. We took the bus home and, you know, an hour and a half later, we're home. And that was my worst experience by far. Um, but, yeah, so that's the big thing I learned about the transit is, you know, during the day at the high peak hours, it's really convenient. You know, for me to get to school is almost more convenient than me driving. If we want to take away, you know, me purchasing a parking pass, me finding the stress of looking for a parking path or parking spot, and then the walking in the winter time, it's those non-peak hours that the bus was a nightmare. Like all my stops were so long and deserted and kind of scary. Um, and I don't. Maybe you can answer this for me. Is, like I understand from a business perspective why it isn't as busy during those times, but I feel like we kind of have a vicious cycle going on with this. You know, people don't want to ride the bus because it doesn't come around enough, and then you know it doesn't come around enough, so people don't want to ride the bus. But this, it's not a profit. Transit doesn't make any money, does it? So let's say that question. <laughs> <laughs> I guess, I guess what I'm building on is I really think we need to kind of reach out and that would be my biggest thing is kind of have more stops during that time because, you know, to get to school was fine, but what about all my other extracurricular social work activities? It was, um, it was difficult, but it was a really overall a great experience and definitely a learning experience and I'm happy I did it. Good times. Well, I work at uh, I'm Tyler, for anyone who didn't hear that the first time around. I work at uh, Carmichael Outreach here in the city, and um, I was fortunate to have a bus stop probably about a block and a half north of my house, which was spectacular for the morning commute. Uh, it was a pretty quick walk, about three minutes out my door, and I could get on the bus. We, uh, I live in Cathedral, um, so to ride downtown, it's a pretty short distance. Uh, if I don't have to drive for my job, and some days I do, I, I try to bike, so that's kind of the context that I'm coming from. I, never really ridden transit in Regina. I think I've used it two times and once was as a student at the University of Regina when I got a, a ticket deal on a Pats Warriors game for a burger, a beer, and a bus ride. So that was like the full scope of my access to transit in Regina. Um, I found the morning commute to be incredibly effective and uh, given that my route stopped about three or four blocks away from Carmichael, I got to walk to Carmichael with a lot of the clients I was going to see about five minutes later anyway. So, um, yeah, the mornings were great. Uh, I struggled a little bit in off-peak hours too, I would think. Uh, would be my, my one little bone of contention. There was a few times where, uh, where there was an activity on the weekend that I had to go from my place out to the east end. Uh, and what would have been a 15 minute drive was about, according to Transit Live, was 89 minutes and ended up being about exactly that. So uh, there was times where I was like just ready to lose my brains just based on time because I'm a little bit ADD anyways. So sitting there for a transfer drove me a little bit bonkers. But um, I found the bus drivers to be incredibly friendly and helpful. I think I would echo what everybody else said. If you have questions, they answer them. And I think I would echo a lot of what, uh, what Brad said. I think a lot of my frustrations that came over the course of the 10 days were probably directly attributable to the complete lack of amount of times that I've used the bus. And I think that I found as I used it, I became a little bit more efficient at it. Uh, one of the things I like to try and do is, is use transfers because it makes me feel important. Uh, there's something exciting about two buses to get home instead of one. And I wanted to try and access as many different routes as I could. So uh, there was a few times where I got caught waiting for transfers and uh, where I found that uh, what I was told was going to be the time that the bus came wasn't actually the time that it came and there was one time where I ended up standing outside for about 30 minutes but you know at the end of the day um, you know I don't, I don't know if there's much that I would really say based on transit experiences I've had in other major cities when I've gone there for work or for other things where 
it seems like what allows those places to have consistency is there's some other mode of transportation in the transit system other than just buses. There's some sort of like light rail transit or subway system that allows for there to be a consistent time that kind of regulates the rest of the transit. And obviously we're not in any situation if you're trying to be building a subway right now. So, um, you know, I think that it's kind of one of those things where I found like the consistency thing could be frustrating at times, but it was also one of those things where you can understand if there's not that, that light rail or that subway thing that has its own track that it's running on that regulates its own times, how there's a little bit of off scheduling that can happen with uh, peak times where there's you know big traffic downtown, rush hour, I can understand how there's, there's a little bit of flux minute to minute. So I think my frustrations were minimal and uh, I found the experience to be an overall positive. Um, that's about all I have to say. Uh, just segue into to the first uh, question about, uh, about uh, if transit makes money. So Nathan, you'll have to correct me here, but this, this is uh, a little of the piece I've been interested in. So the entire budget for transit in Regina is about $26 million, $26 million annually. This year we expect to get a little over $6 million rides. Um, we actually have some of the cheapest rates in all of Western Canada. So it's, it's two fifty dollars for a regular ride. If you buy a 10 pass, it's... Uh, $20, so it's $2 a ride. As far as monthly pass, it's about $60 for an adult. It's 62 and an annual pass would be 600 and some for an adult. Sure, sure. Uh, and actually, our, our senior passes are, are an excellent price. It's, it's about $200 a year for a senior to, to ride a bus the whole, the whole year. So we have some of the cheapest uh, fares. As I understand it, transit is actually never a, a money-making operation. You know, even cities like Vancouver, Toronto that have, I've been in Vancouver waiting for a bus and I have to wait for the next bus because this bus is completely full and the next one's coming in 15 minutes and it's half full too. Um, as I understand it, transit services never make money. There might be some light rail exceptions to that or something. Yeah, that's correct. The majority of all transit systems are subsidized. Sure, to, to, in some way, shape or form. Um, something Nathan has taught me about is, is cost recovery. So the idea of uh, for the money we put in, what is the cost, the cost per ride or, or how much we get back out of it? In Regina, it's, a, it's about 38%. So that means that every 250 you spend on a bus, the city's spending about another 360 something for your bus ride. So it's subsidized by more, more than 50% actually. You know? So this, as I understand it, this isn't way off. A, 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 it's, not, it's not very good actually, but it's um, for a city our side, we should expect to have about 40 to 45% cost recovery. So we're, we're almost there, but uh, we're not quite there. So again, so when you pay 250 or $2, what it's actually costing the city is another, you know, uh, three, 362 or something like that. So, um, so yes, it is a subsidized uh, service. Great. I guess everyone kind of spoke to what's the best and worst experience of the trip. <laughs> With you guys talking about how it's good in the morning and of course in the afternoon, do you guys see yourselves taking it forward? Like, could you see yourselves taking it in the morning to go to school? Or is it something you see is it really working right now? Sure, I think uh, for me, would I take it consistently moving forward? Some of that is dependent, honestly, on, on the work that I do. Yeah. Um, I, I work in housing at Carmichael, so there's times where I have to drive to work because I've got people that I'm taking to viewings over the course of the day. But, um, to get, to get to work and to get home, I mean, it's nice because it's convenient, it's downtown and I live in Cathedral, right? And if I don't try and be a hero and take two buses home, it's uh, it's a lot shorter ride than if I decide I want to take a transfer. So I, I would use it for days that I wouldn't be, that I wouldn't be needing to drive clients. It is something to me that it is, it is of importance to kind of reduce the environmental impact. And if it's running, then I can take that and not have to drive my vehicle. You know, so. I definitely think it's something that I'll incorporate into my lifestyle as is, but there's no possible way, the way it's running right now, that I could rely, well I could rely on it, but it'd be very difficult and far more inconvenient. So I think it, as I mentioned, like my route to the university is excellent. So I walk down like six houses and my bus stops right there and it's a quick walk, quick ride. But. Um, as far as other activities, I, it's far more convenient for me to take my car, so I won't be taking the bus anywhere, but everywhere, but I think I will be incorporating it this winter to avoid some of the parking at the university. No. <laughs> no. 
Fair enough. The, reason, the main reason why I want to take part of this challenge is I, First Nations University of Canada does not have a bus stop. Okay, the majority of our students are transit users. So I wanted to experience what they experience. You know, I, we have students that have to leave, we have single mothers at our university that have to leave two hours earlier to take their kids on the bus to the daycare, get back on another bus, transfer to get down to the university and still walk all the way across from Rydell Center to First Nations University. So I really, I'm really adamant about saying we really need one at First Nations University. Like if I would have, I could have took the earlier bus, I would have to leave my house an extra 45 minutes early. Okay, so that means I'd be leaving before 8 o'clock to get to my class at 9.30. And there's, I have literally two minutes to run from Riddell Center all the way across. Trust me, I can't do it. Obviously, I'm not a runner, first of all. Secondly, I just wouldn't want to try to run that in two minutes. But that's, that was the main reason. So now I know exactly when they come to me on the Student Association or come to any other Student Association member saying they really want a bus stop there, I know where they're coming from. Especially when I think about it, if someone has a full day of classes and then they have to get back on the bus to go pick up their kids from the daycare to get back on another bus, then it really, really makes their day a lot more challenging. And if anything that we can do to alleviate some of those stresses for our students, I think it's, it'd be great. So I just wanted to experience that. But I, I can say, at least I know now, how to use the transit system. I have the app. It was free. Thank you, guys. <laughs> yeah, I, I'll say um, my opinions changed actually over the time. You know, I, I think maybe halfway through, I was sort of under pressure. I, I probably wouldn't use the bus much, uh, as is. I would say now uh, it depends on the application. Uh, the things that. Sean. Yeah. Excuse me. How about if you say. Oh, sure. Okay, yeah, sure. Sorry about that. Thanks. Um, things that it didn't. doesn't really work for me. I, my son's daycare is in uh, North Central. That trip takes about an hour on the bus. I can do it in about 25 minutes in the car, and I don't have to wait outside with a screaming child. So I, I probably won't use the bus for that. To get downtown, I, I live just down Vic, not too far. Um, it's great. There's the number nine, the number seven. So there's four buses every hour. It's not every, you know, it's not every 15 minutes, but it's every half hour for both buses. Um, so to get downtown, it's I, I'll use it. You know, I, I still like to bike. I still like to walk, but uh, I will always use this instead of an ex my, my vehicle. I think as an excuse to get downtown. To get to the university, I really hate driving to the university because of parking. So uh, if I need to go to the university for meetings come up once in a while, that sort of thing with the council, um, I think I'll use the bus for the university. So I will use it for the university, I will use it to get downtown, and also the number seven uh, goes from Cathedral to Heritage. So um, when I end up in Cathedral for whatever, it's, uh, you know, maybe not every time, but it's something that works for me too. So the, my answer is uh, some applications yes and some applications no. That's 
that's the attitude we have to have is if we want more people to ride the bus, we have to offer a service that, that works for people. So unfortunately that's not a million dollar place. <laughs> but I think uh, Regina is growing, you know, and again transit either kind of leads that growth, stays equal that growth, or follows that growth. And right now I think we've, we've sort of been on our heels, you know, that we haven't had growth for the past decades, and now that it is happening, again we see a, an increase in ridership of nine percent and an increase in budget of again not to point fingers. I mean if I point fingers I guess I should put fingers at myself on that. But um, you know, I think we have to be aware of what transit means for, for the city as a whole. Okay, so I think we're kind of with the participant aspect. But uh, did anyone want to ask any questions or make any statements about transit John like Yes. Um, most of you said you're not going to use transit uh, very much. Uh, during the past two weeks, did any of you use uh, cabs or car sharing in, in your uh, to supplement uh, transit? I'm and, a student, if, and if not, why not? Sure. I'm a student. I don't have cab money. Sure. I'm a counselor. I don't have cab money. <laughs> <laughs> I use the cabs actually. That was my main way of getting around on the weekends. If I was uh, going out and then coming back out, but that isn't uh, usually any different from something that I would normally do. Yeah, I, I didn't, uh, probably just because, like for me, for the, the big thing was the commute to work, and then my weekends were relatively quiet because I was doing yard work for the most part, but, uh, so I didn't really have to, I guess, would be answer one, and then answer two would be, it was just, for work, it was so convenient for me to get on the bus and ride it to work that it, I just didn't need to. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Uh, I actually use transit quite a bit. Uh, it sounds like you guys, for the most part, had good experiences with the bus drivers, and for the most part, I have had good experiences. But some have um, been kind of rude uh, when asked if they would radio ahead uh, and find out what's happening with the bus. They would say, uh, oh, I can't get a hold of them or something like that, or um, I'm going to be late, and they would make excuses. So there were some problems like that. Another thing with the changes downtown, I noticed uh, it's kind of nice knowing where all the buses stop downtown, where you have it organized that way. It spreads out the buses, though, which makes it kind of difficult for people to get to them in time. So one bus might come a little late, and it's the one you're going to transfer to is on the other other end and it's taking off as you're just moving in. I can move pretty quick, I got long legs, um, but like for people that are maybe a little slower, elderly, uh, I know my mom who takes the bus, it, she's not going to be moving so fast. So she's going to, she ends up like missing the bus and then she has to wait quite a while for the next bus to come. That's um, another thing I have a problem with. Uh, another thing I would like to point out is uh, with uh, like holiday service. Uh, it's nice when there is holiday service, but it's kind of inconsistent. You don't, you can't go, like some people go like, oh, well, is there gonna be like holiday service? I don't know. You know, it's not something that's gonna uh, univer universally applied. Sometimes you'll have like a holiday service on there. It'd be nice if it was applied like all the time, but I, I understand there's budget constraints and all that other thing. Um, so, one good thing I will point out is, is the express service. I live downtown, and I like it that it goes north and south. I like that one. Uh, the only thing is it only it only goes to about like 9 o'clock, and it doesn't work on weekends. Um, that I like. It'd be nice if that could be expanded in some way. Um, and I've been out to uh, like First Nations University, too, uh, like for some events. And I understand what you're talking about, where you have to get off, off the bus. And I... You know, I've been there actually winter time. <laughs> That's terrible. If you got like blizzard and everything else like that, you're trying to go from Riddell Center down to the First Nations University. That's not a good experience. <laughs> That's just a few of the things I just wanted to bring. I have a question for Sean, but yeah. <laughs> well, let's, let's see that first. Let's give me a second. Okay, my question was. Can you give me a little bit more insight as towards if they were to, if the city council was to move the larger buses outside of downtown and replace them with smaller shuttles? Is that what 
Am I just wording this right? I just, I, I'm just trying to grasp, like, so do you have to, when do you get onto the big bus? You know, like, or do you just all get on these little small shows and before you know it, you gotta have 30 people standing outside instead of 10. Sure. I'll maybe pass that to Dan, the sort of the resident expert. Okay, so yeah, the motion is forward to for us to investigate that. Um, I'm just trying to service, this, what, yeah. the service model being the that, size of the shuttle. Yeah, it, it would be it'd be like a 20 person shuttle. So if you say exactly some there's a full bus, 40 people on it, and there's a 20 person shuttle, how's that going to work? Well, it may not work. No. So that's why we're uh, the service model that they, they've uh, asked us to investigate is keeping your buses uh, out of broad neck, you know, outside of or the downtown, and then have your shuttles come in. Um, so that is ongoing. That's uh, I believe it's duty council in uh, November. Um, and uh, from my perspective, there's a lot of challenges with shuttles in the downtown. Um, transfers, how many people are on the bus, how many get on the small bus, how many shuttles do we need? Um, so I'll be eager to so see. So would there results. be another hub outside of downtown for the big buses that basically. we have to get off and get onto those ones too? Yeah, so there basically would be a hub on Albert Broad Vic that they would meet, the shuttles would be there, and then they would sort of be to the downtown. The way I see that, it would be a disaster for the Cornwall Centre because they won't have people waiting there to get on the buses. I, I have a few different things. I, the, first, the transit live stuff, all the banking with all the, I assume it's GPS data and all that kind of stuff seems fantastic, but I've never liked the website and the actual interface, the public stuff, and the having to have a separate app and all these kind of things it just seems a nightmare, especially when everyone else just has all this available on Google Maps. So you can go in and you can say, I want to go from here to here, and Google Maps tells you the route. And so I don't understand why you'd need a separate app and a separate website and you, then you need to type in all the addresses and all that kind of stuff when people are, you know, in every other city you just go boom, boom, and then it tells you which route to get at what time. And you, you seem to have all the infrastructure that can handle that with, with live times and, and Google Maps can update the times in their database if buses are running late and all that kind of stuff. And so that seems like the obvious way to go. Um, and then the second thing which kind of ties in that into that is that the single, from what I've seen internationally, the single, um, what's the word, variable that affects usership seems to be reliability. And that actually people are willing to have a slightly less regular service, or even a slightly more expensive service, or a slightly slower service that takes a longer time to get there. If they actually know when they turn up at the bus stop at a particular time, there will be a bus for them. And so I never understood why if a bus driver gets to a bus stop five minutes early, he doesn't wait there for five minutes. And if he gets to the next stop two minutes early, he doesn't wait there for two minutes. And so you, you build in a slightly longer journey time, but they actually wait at the stops so that people can have a set time they, they know they need to be at the stop by. And then if you have that, even if it's every, you know, even if it's major stops that have fixed times, then that helps with issues with transfers and things like that as well, because the buses know they don't have they're not allowed to leave until the previous guy arrives and they have to wait a couple of minutes. And, and it can't eliminate all issues, obviously, because if one bus does get stuck in a traffic jam, then the transfer has to wait for that as well. But it just seems like an obvious thing where, you know, at least you avoid any issues of buses leaving early. Um, and, and then tied in with that access to information about where the buses are and what time they're going to be arriving makes that so much easier for people. So, yeah. The, uh, other than the time points that are there where they have dedicated times, and then the, the bus stops in between. We can't hear. Sure. So, when they're going to their time points through the bus stops, um, you're indicating that they could stop and each stop if they're running ahead of time, that type of thing. Um, also, have to kind of consider the experience of the people on the bus as well, going into A and B as quick as possible. And there does have to be that uh, extra time built in where, where, where it can be allowed in case of traffic, accident, detour, winter, um, that, that that's a course. So, uh, but no, that's that's good. Having effective scheduling, making sure that there's not a lot of wait time, early time. Um, extra time is good at the end of the road, so when you may have to transfer if you're on a shuttle bus and it doesn't catch your legs. And just a comment on the transit live as well. Um, 
we've been working with uh, these guys and they've been really good on uh, what they, uh, they uh, can do for us. And they're actually working, uh, they have a working prototype right now which we're testing. It integrates the trip planner and so uh, they would have it start here, end here, it gives you the trip, so they use the, it's the Google interface to do the user planning function. But we're also um, exploring our data to Google as well uh, in the near future. Uh, challenge with that, just working to make sure that our data is correct and, and it works correctly. Okay. I, I just think specifically on the waiting at stops, you know, if you have a fixed timetable and people know what they're getting into, they can't really complain about having to wait at a stop for a couple of minutes if the alternative is the bus leaving early and people missing their buses. I think having people be able to turn up at a stop and get the bus they expect to get is far more important than someone saving a couple of minutes on a slightly shorter journey time because you just happen to have good traffic that day. scheduling and your predictions on the time? Yeah. yeah. So they're, again, they, they provide us a lot of data that is scheduled as well. So um, looking at those types of reports, where do these buses we can go back and see what did the bus do, so historical tracking, how it traveled through, at what time it traveled through, so it's a good tool. previous one was really late. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would love to see the city, you know, where, where possible. I, was, I just met this gentleman here tonight um, and, and uh, mentioned to him about uh, environmental fuel. Um, I, again, because I live on Hamilton Street, uh, I've noticed in my apartment how quickly the dust builds up and, uh, and the, the dirt on my walls um, and I know that's not only from the buses, it's from the general traffic but um, I'm a very strong environmentalist and I'd love to see some kind of environmental fuel. Luke was going to suggest, um, he you know, suggesting maybe like a natural gas kind of option something that would be better for the environment. Um, so um, I did notice one day I took a heritage bus for the first time not too long ago and I think that service is great and I noticed that there had been a change recently to a smaller bus which I thought was an excellent decision because when I was on the heritage bus there was like two or three other ladies on there with me so uh, looking at that as a cost-effective measure I thought was a great idea. And I also think the express buses are a wonderful addition. Um, I'm from Australia originally. I've been here many years, but I find the winters just... Um, <laughs> Delightful. Brutal. And I'm not, you know, <laughs> not 210 pounds, and I get cold very fast. And. Um, I did a, I called into the CBC noon uh, edition one day when uh, one of the councillors was on there, I think from Saskatoon, um, talking about transit. 
And I threw this out to him. I was surprised. He said he thought this was a great idea because I thought I'm really shooting for the moon here. But I thought, wouldn't it be great if the bus shelters could have solar panels on them so that that the, they would be warm. Um, you could huddle in there and, uh, and get some warmth on those horrible, <laughs> windy, cold days that make me not want to go outside at all. Um, I am dealing with a medical issue and because of that I am on a CPP disability. And if I was on uh, the disability program under Saskatchewan, I could qualify for uh, the very low bus fare. But because I'm on a federal program, there's nothing I can tap into. And, uh, you know, I'm sure, obviously, I'm not the only person probably that's in that kind of situation. And if the city could provide a similar program when you're on, you know, a, a federal program, eventually, if if things continue, I will uh, tap into the SED program, which is the social services program for people on disability. Um, and then, as I said, that that would, you know, this uh, discounted fare would kick in. But there's nothing for those of us who are just on a federal. Um, and picking up on, on what you said about the you know the nighttime service, yeah, again me as a, as a woman um, particularly, uh, there's been a couple of instances. One where uh, there, there was construction on Broad Street, and so I think it was the number three bus was being rerouted, and it went right down Hamilton Street, and right down 14th, which is both my streets and so I thought oh okay I can get off on the bus stop on the corner of uh, Hamilton and 13th and walk down the block so I did the you know pulled the cord and I went sailing right by and I thought oh okay because it's not its regular route it's not going to stop until it gets to Shoppers and I ran up to the bus driver and he kindly stopped and let me off, I think it was on 14th, right opposite my building. And I was in Moose Jar recently and uh, had taken the bus from here to Moose Jar and then I got the local bus from there to where I was going to stay. And again, the bus driver kindly let me off when it wasn't a scheduled stop, but there was only one other lady on the bus with me. So I, you know, I'm thinking for nighttime service when there's so few people on the bus, could the bus drivers then be permitted to Never. bypass the, the stops and if, you know, and, and drop you off at a closer location because it's not going to disrupt anything, it's not peak hour um, issues. Um, and although, although I, uh, I'm not talking about senior fares. I do have a question. I know that, you're, that there is the discounted senior fare. Do seniors need to pay that in a lump sum? Because I'm wondering if they do, whether for some seniors it might be more feasible if they could break that up into monthly payments, like you would, you know, when you when you put your driver's license on a on a monthly schedule rather than a, a lump sum. Um, yeah, just. Uh Maybe you can do that. You can be both paid one lump sum, but, but you can be pre authorized. Okay. So it comes up once a month. So okay. Okay, great. Six months. Yes, yeah, so you, you can purchase a senior pass for six months or a year in a lump sum or a pre authorized payment, and I believe it's sixteen eighty seven a month is okay. what it works out to. Okay, okay. Um, and just Bring this up. I know I'm taking a while. This is my last, my last thing. Um, I did phone in about this because I used to uh, purchase my groceries at Sobeys on Lakeshore, and I got on the number three one day, um, thinking, okay. <laughs> and then we started sailing by, and again, fortunately, the bus driver dropped me off on the corner of Hillsdale and Muscana Parkway. And then I talked to one or two other people for who the 
for, for whom the fact that that corner had been cut out became an issue. Um, and there is the, the express university bus that goes down Lascana Parkway anyway. And if that has not been reinstituted, I would like to suggest that it is. Because as I said, um, for one person who was working at Sobeys, I know that it's closed down now, but he had to take then the number four and circle all the way around to get to, uh, basically he lives in that shopper's drug mart area as well. And another person who worked at the hospital said she had to leave something like half hour or 45 minutes earlier in the morning to be able to make her connections. So I'd like to throw that out as well. Thank you for the time. switched to a, an unsubsidized route. So the cost went from like $2 to $8 overnight. So 16 return if you're going both ways. But that allowed them to have it far more regularly. And so it actually increased the usage. The issue there though is that a taxi to the airport from Wellington Central is $40. And so there's a huge incentive to use the bus. Whereas here from downtown, I can get to the airport for $10. And if I've got baggage, if I've got luggage, and I've got you know all sorts of different things, and especially if it's only one person, you know I'm not going to pay eight or even five or maybe even three dollars for a bus that's going to take me an hour to get there, and it's less regular. I can hop in a taxi for ten dollars. So I think just because the airport is so close, it makes it impractical. I think. Yes, the, uh, the pricing of the alternative modes of transportation 
plays into it. Just like, especially if you're um, paying like five or six hundred dollars for flights, the extra ten dollars for a taxi really, you know. <laughs> yeah, the same thing can be said for um, pricing other work, other places like parking or the cost of getting a ticket in the city. Um, and compare that to uh, uh, your time and the money that it takes to ride the bus. Um, so those things all go hand in hand on the prices of uh, external uh, or other modes of transportation. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure John will have something to say on this as well, but if you hugely subsidize parking, then you hugely subsidize buses, you're actually just cancelling yourself out. So if you price the parking right, it would give the incentives the bus lined up better in the first place, so you wouldn't need the 